Well, I will, um, since everybody's here, I'll start with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students. Just ask you to bless this time we have together, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Um, so let me just take a couple minutes to talk about some solutions to the homework you guys just turned in. Um, I'll focus my attention on one thing, and then if you want to talk about something else, we can. But uh, let's see here. Um, I'll start with... Uh, I'm going to try to focus my attention on the rotation problems. So like problem 140, let me just remind, restate the problems for you briefly. So problem 140, we define the special orthogonal group on two by two matrices. So essentially the matrix of an orthogonal transformation that has determinant one. So part A, I asked you to show that it has to look like a rotation, actually. And then part B, um, I told you that the trace of the transformation was the square root of two. Um, and the determinant was 1. And then I said, by what angle does T rotate? That was problem 140. We'll look at the solution here in just a minute. Problem 141, I told you that theta is not equal to a multiple of pi for some, not, not, not an integer multiple of pi. And then I said, look at this matrix, cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine, with 1 here. So basically what this matrix does is, is it, it fixes the z-axis, doesn't like do anything to it, just kind of leaves it alone but then points in the xy plane it's rotating. So it, it's, uh, it's going to rotate vectors in some sense around the xy with respect to the xy plane. And so if, if a vector happens to lie on the z-axis, it just fixes it. Um, and I said find the complex eigenvalues and real eigenvectors of R, so we'll look at that. Um, then problem 142, I said look at this uh, special orthogonal matrix. Show that if we have, you know, a special orthogonal matrix, in other words, if it's orthogonal with determinant 1, and it's not the identity, then R has only two eigenvectors of unit length for which lambda equals to 1. All right. So an example of such a matrix is already given to you in problem 141. In problem 141, we have such a matrix. This is an SO3 matrix, and it only has two eigenvectors of eigenvalue 1, namely plus or minus E3. See, those are the, those are the axis vectors, essentially. The unit vectors along the axis of rotation are those eigenvectors with eigenvalue 1. We'll, we'll get into it in just a second here. But. And then problem 143 is actually building off these past two problems. You have a special orthogonal um, traceless matrix. By what angle does it rotate? All right, so I'll explain to you how we can do that problem. It does seem kind of like very mysterious. If you don't approach it in the right way, this problem seems like impossible to me. This, I mentioned in the announcement, that's not supposed to be there. I don't know how that got to be there, but anyway. All right, so let me go to start problem 140. I'll try to go through these pretty fast because I want to leave you guys time for other questions. Um, so like problem 140 is just really just brute force, hand-to-hand -hand combat, I, I, you know, you have a transpose is equal to a transpose a is equal to i. So you guys told you I told you in the other help session that it's smart to not look at it that way, but to look at it as a inverse is equal to a transpose, which is this is equal to that. But the thing is, you know that the determinant's one, so that's one. So that straight up gives you the equations a equals d and b equals minus c. But you also know that a squared plus b squared is one. So it's natural to set a equals to cosine theta and b equals to sine theta for some theta because the real numbers that, you know, some square, sum of squares is one, and um, so I can I can put a equals to cosine theta and b equals to sine theta like that. So, yeah, I'm sure you could you could improve on my solution a little bit, but that's that's essentially it. Um, part B. Remember, part B. I told you that. Uh, the, um, what was it, the, um, the trace was square root of 2. So if we have, um, and, and, and I also had the determinant was 1, I think, was given, right? So we're, we have a matrix that, so the matrix of the transformation then is an SO2 matrix, like this, but I also gave you that the trace of the matrix was, well, the trace of the transformation, which is the trace of the matrix by definition, is square root of 2. So square root of 2 is equal to 2 cosine theta. So cosine theta is 
root 2 over 2, which is to say that theta is pi over 4. I think what I have crossed out there was impossible. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but I fixed it for you guys. Let's see here. Um, this one here. Now I've forgotten the problem statement. Oh, we'll figure it out together. So I have a rotation matrix of this form, right? And I'm trying to calculate the eigenvalues of it. So I just do that. You know, here's the characteristic equation. Um, but the thing is, I've already got a completed square over here, right? And so the only way that this is not an irreducible real polynomial is if this sine theta is somehow 0. But when is sine squared theta going to be 0? It's only for integer multiples of pi, right? So because I've ruled out theta equals to n pi, this is necessarily irreducible, which means that all of the real eigenvalues are found over here. There's just lambda equals to 1 is your only real eigenvalue. There are complex eigenvalues, cosine theta plus or minus i sine theta for this. All right, so in terms of complex, these are you know, complex eigenvalues, but those wouldn't count, right? The real eigenvalue is just 1. That's it. And if you look at it, and I don't really think you need to do any calculation to see this, it's actually clear by inspection that the eigenvalue with eigenvalue 1 is just the non-zero vectors on the z-axis, really. But you can calculate r minus i is this. That matrix is invertible. That 2 by 2 matrix is invertible. So if you look at the kernel of this, it forces, um, we can't have anything over here because eigenvector has to be 0, 0, 1. If you, if you do the calculation here, you can reduce this to, um, again, this is an invertible matrix if you, if you calculate it. Um, I don't know, I, what's the best way? To, the laziest way to argue is here is just to observe that 0, 0, 1 is, an eigen, is, is in, in the null space of this matrix, right? What's the dimension of the eigenspace with eigenvalue 1? Well, the algebraic multiplicity of it's 1. So the geometric multiplicity is also 1, right? Geometric multiplicity is always at least 1. And it can be up to the algebraic multiplicity. So in the case that the geometric, in the case that the algebraic multiplicity is 1, the geometric multiplicity has to be 1. In other words, there always exists an eigenvector for each eigenvalue. Um, in this case, annoyingly, the eigenvalue is also 1. <laughs> Everything is 1. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Anyway, there you go. Um, <clears throat> oh, what do you know? I've written that up here. OK, so um, <clears throat> I wasn't reading that. <laughs> I was just saying it. Um, well, I did not ask for this. You might also notice that if we looked at the rotation times e to the plus or minus i theta, we would get e to the plus or minus i theta times that. Um, so in fact, um, you could use e1 and e2 as the, the basis. That e1, e2, e3 is actually a real Jordan basis. Because the matrix as it's given is already in a real Jordan form. The matrix as it's given is rj, I think it's rji, direct sum with j11 in my language. Because the upper block is a rotation block, and the lower block was just one in the original matrix. So it's already in real Jordan form. Anyway, the, the, the larger geometry here is just that that matrix rotates in, around the z-axis. So it's, it's rotating around the z-axis is what's going on by angle theta. Um, problem 142. I, I need to remind myself the statement of it. I'm sorry. I was. Uh, I should remember what page we were on. Well, I'm supposed to show what? If we have a special orthogonal matrix, then it has only two eigenvectors of unit length. So notice the difference between 141 and 142. 141 is that specific matrix. 142 is an arbitrary SO3 matrix. So what I'm saying in 142 is what happened in 141 is not an accident. It always happens for such a matrix. This one I'll get stuck on if I'm not careful. This one to me is hard. 
um, if we have not the identity matrix and we have this condition, we know that the inverse is equal to the transpose, right? And so if we have an eigenvector v, right, then if you multiply by the inverse here, you can derive that the same vector is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 over lambda for the inverse. So there's this juxtaposition between eigenvectors and eigenvalues for the matrix and eigenvectors and eigenvalues for the inverse of the matrix if it is invertible, all right? And also, the matrix and its transpose share the same characteristic equation. So the transpose of the matrix and the matrix have the same eigenvalues. So what that means is that A and A transpose share the same eigenvalues, which means that A and A inverse have reciprocal eigenvalues. So, in other words, if the eigenvalues of R are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, then the um, reciprocals of those must be equal to those because the eigenvalues of A and the eigenvalues of A inverse have to be reciprocal. That means that this set has to be equal to that set. So how do you make that happen? And what else do we know? The determinant of the matrix is 1, right? So the product the product of these guys also has to be one. So <laughs> how do you how do you do that? You know how do you have three things? So <clears throat> lambda one, lambda two, lambda three is, is one. We do not know that the order matches, of course. All right. So I say if two of the eigenvalues were one, say without loss of generality, lambda two and lambda one were one, then that would make that 1 over lambda 3 has to be equal to lambda 3, which would say that lambda 3 is plus or minus 1. But the thing is, if it's plus 1, we're back to the identity matrix, which we've ruled out. And if it's minus 1, then the determinant's not 1, because you have 1 times 1 times minus 1, which is minus 1. So we can, we can then assume that we can't have two of the eigenvalues being 1. We already know we can't have all three of the eigenvalues being 1, because that's the identity matrix. So it must be that only one of the eigenvalues is 1, which means what? That means that the other two have to be, um, let's see here. Well, they have to be complex conjugate pairs, where they have to be. I don't know if I've gotten to that yet. but um, <clears throat> So anyway, most one eigenvalue can be real here. And the algebraic multiplicity, how do I know that the, oh, I'm saying hence the algebraic multiplicity of lambda 1 is 1 which means that the geometric multiplicity is also just one. So that means that the lambda equal one eigenspace is just one dimensional. And that means that there is at most two unit vectors with eigenvalue one. That's, that's the argument. If you didn't get this homework problem, it's not a statement that is in no way damning for the next test at all. I mean, this is not. It's totally possible to have a mastery of this course and not get this problem. This is a hard problem, all right? Um, I mean, the skills that it takes to crack this problem are not really linear algebra. They're just algebra and tinkering. And I, 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 I don't even know how to quite characterize the skill set that you need to solve this problem, honestly. Um, <clears throat> so there's a gap in the previous page. How do I know that there exists? Um, I can, I've argued that there can be at most one. How do I know that there is even one? Um, so I don't know, I've spent enough time on this problem. I mean, I'm trying to so here, here, I, here I give some additional arguments where I try to explain why um, in any possible contingency that you consider, there's always at least one solution, which is one. I'm not, I don't know. There, there may still be a gap in the solution in that sense. <clears throat> Let's move on to the next problem, <coughs> which is in some sense more interesting. So if I have an SO3 matrix and it's traceless, right, then I can let, um, I can pick a basis, right? I can pick a basis where V3 is that eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 that we talked about in the previous problem, right? And so like R V3 is V3, and yet I know that neither V1 nor V2 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. I mean, these are something else. 
In fact, I know that the perp for V3 is the span of V1 and V2. Because <clears throat> if I look at this from a complex perspective, V1 and V2 are, um, they could be used to form the, uh, the direct sum of the um, plus or minus i, um, excuse me, plus or minus e to the i theta eigenspaces. And those are perpendicular to the one eigenspace. And anyway, you can, you can verify that V3 perp is, 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 is V1 and V2. And we also have assumed that V3 is length 1. So if you look at it, what we've got is that um, <clears throat> the perp is two-dimensional. And oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm not reading this correctly. What I'm saying is this is a claim, and here's the reasons why, OK? I explain why this is, is that as we, in, this, in, this, in this right here. I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten my, my jibber-jabber. So the, the long story short of it is if I can build V1, V2, and V3 in this way, if you look at the formula for T, um, you know, uh, it's 0 for any linear combination of V1 and V2. It acts on V3 to be 0. Um, and let's see here. I'll get to the point eventually, guys. So, <clears throat> so with respect to this basis I've just constructed, I can choose V1 and V2 and V3 essentially to make the matrix of T look like this, is my point. All right, because there's the eigenvalue with real eigenvalue with eigenvalue vector. There's the eigenvalue 1, and the eigenvector corresponding to that we think of as the axis of the rotation. And then the basis, which is perpendicular to that, are, there are going to be a pair of vectors which are in the plane which is perpendicular to that vector. So you can set those up as like an x and a y axis and choose the angle counterclockwise off one of those. All right? and, and in so doing, you can set up coordinates which makes the matrix be just the standard rotation with respect to the v3 axis. So what I'm saying in this problem is that problem that original example problem 141 is actually general if you just make a change of coordinates for an SO3 trans for an SO3 matrix, which is not the identity. You can always like similarity transform one of those into this. And so it's always just a rotation about some plane and some axis. A three-dimensional rotation can always be rewritten as a rotation about some particular axis. Um, and so once you know that, then, then it's easy to finish the problem because the trace of this matrix is 2 times cosine theta plus 1. And the trace is equal to the trace of a matrix in any basis is equal to the trace of the transformation. So I told you that the trace of the transformation was 0, so that makes 2 cosine theta plus 1 equal to 0, which means that theta is inverse cosine of a half, which is apparently 2 pi over 3. Now. I think I've given this problem in previous years, and I've had students solve it by just like feeding a specific matrix different vectors and seeing what happens to them, and then calculating the angle between the vectors enough to like figure out what the angle was. Like it's it's conceivable if I gave you more numerical data, you could do that sort of thing, but it's not really the not really the idea here. All right. Anyway, so I think that's. I, I just wanted to. Part of the reason I'm talking about this is I don't want you guys to be like super frightened by these homework problems. These are. You know, these are kind of deep study problems. They're not so much, hey, I'm warning you about this problem. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is, you know, this is like a typical test problem. No, no, these are classical results which take time and energy to derive is what they are. Now, problem 144 actually does make for a nice test question because it, not, not in this form, but basically the heart of this problem is makes a nice test question. Like, see what this is? If we take a, a parallel piped with, with edges v1 through vn, and we feed it to a linear transformation which has matrix R, then it gives us the, the image parallel piped would have edges Rv1, Rv2, Rvn. And the thing is, if you calculate the determinant of that, that gives you the volume of the transformed parallelogram. But because of the way matrix multiplication works, we can factor R out by the column by column rule. And then determinant of product is a product of the determinants. The thing is, if R is, happens to be a transformation with the determinant 1, 
then what this little calculation means is that an orthogonal transformation preserves volumes. It prefer, preserves the volume of a parallel pipette with side with edges z1 through vn. And that, that I think is actually a decent kind of test question. Not and especially if I let make it like three dimensional, then it becomes a very decent test question. In contrast, the I send you guys a link. The problem way way back in the notes was a transformation which didn't have determinant one, and you saw the parallelogram go from one area to a different area, like it stretched it out. It didn't preserve the area. When I say volume, I mean the generalized notion of volume, which again, that's we talked about this. Determinants generalize the notion of volume, like we take in n dimensions, stick your n vectors in the determinant of the rectangle, rectangular solid with those as edges is given by the determinant. And that volume could be area in two dimensions, or it could be literally spatial volume as we're considering in th our three dimensions. But four dimensions, we still call it volume. We might call it hypervolume if we're feeling particularly benevolent to the students. Do you guys have any other ones you'd like for me to talk about what you're supposed to get out of the problem? You can take a breath. They may not be posted yet. I, well, I, th I guess they are. I don't remember. I apologized for this already in the um, um, email, but you know, the the problem 138. Well, not 138 so much, but 139. You know, this symmetric bilinear form business. I haven't talked about that in lecture yet, and I'm sorry about that. It was, you know, we we're talking about that Friday. Um, even in my original plan, I was just talking about it Wednesday, so it's still out of you know out of order. I just didn't have time to fix it. Sorry about that. I expected you guys to come ask me questions about it once you saw it, but yeah, um, it's not bad. It's just so this you know this problem, the formula. V transpose eta W. I mean, really, once you understand what I say in the final chapter of the notes, essentially, as soon as you write this formula, you've already proved that it's bilinear. If you can write a formula for the for the function from V cross V to the scalars such that it's the row of the first entry times the square matrix times the column of the second entry, that already proves bilinearity because it's going to be linear in the first entry and linear in the second entry because of the way matrix multiplies. So essentially in the same way that if you can write a matrix column multiplication formula for a linear transformation, it proves it's linear. This is the analog of that for quote unquote bilinear maps. But I mean, here's the proof of symmetry in stupid gory detail. This times that is actually that. And if you just change the order of the letters, it's that which is that, so it's symmetric. So the, the quintessential symmetric bilinear form is just the dot product. The dot product is a symmetric bilinear form. You can, you, you can prove that a, that, a, that a form is symmetric if and only if its matrix is symmetric. Uh, anyway, I'll talk more about this Friday, so I don't want to do too much more here. Can I? Do you want me to skip over to mission nine, or what do you guys want to talk about? Um, unless you want to give us the quiz on Wednesday. Oh, the quiz on Wednesday. Sure. Let's see here. Let's go back to the past. Where are, we're, so we're kind of in the, the home stretch here, right? Um, What was the bonus quiz? <laughs> Test three after party. I forgot all about this. This is exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm gonna forget about that. Let's see here. It's from a simpler time. As, as be, before we, you know, we, we party all the time now with Top Hat, so it's, it's different. We live in a different world now. So probably, you know, probably test three is from last, just test three from last year. So 
we can we can look. I'll, I'll look at the solution here in just a second. Let me show you the problems without solutions just you to know start with. It's not. It's not. I'm lazy. Um, so, calculate the complex angle between z and z transpose would be a problem. Hmm. I'm just going to read through these real quick, and then I'll put up the solution. That way, people can write them down and work on them without seeing the solution if they want. Yeah. Suppose a has eigenvalue three. Prove a squared has eigenvalue nine. To me, it was it was it was. Um, I was I was demoralized by how few people got this problem last year. Honestly, this was this to me was very troubling that more people didn't get this one. That's a pretty standard plain Jane problem. Maybe the problem is I don't have enough of that in the homework at the moment. I don't know. Here's a uh, bunch of non-zero real vectors. Here's some. Uh, Various matrix equations that they satisfy for some 4 by 4 matrix find the real Jordan form of A and determine if it's diagonalizable over R or C. Can you guys tell me the answer to this one? What does this say? V1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 3. What's this say? This, this to me says that V2 is not an eigenvector, but it is a... I take, yeah. If I multiply this by a minus three i on both sides, I get what? A minus three i v one. Well, that's zero. So I get a minus three i squared times v two is zero. So v two is a generalized eigenvector with eigenvalue two. Three. I'm an idiot. So if we if we arrange v two and v one together, they form a, a two chain for eigenvalue three. And um, over here, what's this? V1, V3 plus IV4 is that. I mean, this says that this is what, what, what A has a complex eigenvalue of what? 3 plus 7i, right. So, no, this is not going to be diagonalizable over, over R or for C because this gives us a 2 by 2 Jordan 3 block. and Changing to complex numbers doesn't fix that. I mean, yeah, in the complex numbers we can diagonalize this piece, sure, but not not that not that part. <clears throat> Again, I'll put up the solution here in a second. Um, here's an orthogonal subset of a real vector space V with inner product lingle comma wrangle. Given that zero is not in S, prove it's linearly independent. Uh, this is like a fastball straight down the middle. This is something we proved in class. I spent like 10 minutes doing this, right? I mean, this, this is, well, between 2 and 10 minutes doing this. I can't remember. But anyway. Um, here's a couple vectors in four dimensions. W is the span of these guys. Find an orthonormal basis for W. How would you do it? Yeah, run Graham Schmidt on this, right? So. Um, you know, normalize that thing, in other words, divide by 3. And then pick off the piece of this which is in that direction using Gram-Schmidt algorithm. And then normalize, of course. Um, then we'd use the projection idea to pick the part of x. Um, ooh. So I'd, I project this in the w direction to find x, and then whatever's left is y. Um, which point in W is closest to this X? Yeah. Was this was this a homework problem? Um, there was, yeah, there was one comment like that. Yeah. Um, and then here's what we were talking about. You know, what was it? Monday? I can't remember. Today's Wednesday, right? Yeah, it must have been Monday. So if you've got this quadratic form, you can find the symmetric matrix A for which that, right? 5, 4, 4, 5. Find the eigenvalues in orthonormal eigenvectors, right? Um, build the formula using the eigencoordinates and eigenvectors, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's going to be eigenvalue x bar, eigenvalue 1, x bar 1, x bar squared. Eigenvalue 2, y bar squared is the formula, 
you know, and then sketch the graph, which is easy to do once we just draw the eigencoordinates, and it's going to be an ellipse or a hyperbola in the in the rotated coordinates, or I don't know, lots of it. Problem seven. I have v a vector space, distinct scalars alpha and beta, v a transformation such that there exists non-zero x and y with t of x is alpha x and t of y is beta y. <coughs> Prove that x y is linearly independent. Interesting. <laughs> hmm. 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 I don't remember this problem. I must have had I must have had a very creative mood that day. Let's see here. Um, ah, here's a weirdo. Uh, true. Oh, true. False. Explain your choice. Oh, I was. I was fun to grade. Let's see here. Will you give us Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, sometimes I just grade these on the basis of the true-false, and I don't care what's written. It depends on if I'm in a, if I'm in a pinch for time, sometimes I'll do that. I, I haven't artificially inflated the score of certain tests in that way. Like, I'll be not looking at answers, I'll be like, true, 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 whatever, true, 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 whatever. And then I, I make the mistake. I, my eyes drift away from the true or false, and then I read something that was written, and I go, oh. no, no, you committed to just grading the true or false. <laughs> I, I need to be able to write something in case I have time to actually, you know, grade it. Um, for you guys, I probably have time, don't worry. But um, actually, I mean, who knows if there's going to be true or false on your next test, right? I mean, um, but I, I can learn a lot from true or false questions. It's just true. Um, but here's a formula, you know, is it an inner product? Mm. And um, here's something, what's this say? T has this, oh, man. At the moment, these, that question is hard to me at the moment. I don't know what's wrong with me, yeah. I gotta look at the solution. I don't know. Um, problem nine. Suppose T and itself a joint. All right. So prove if T has eigenvalue lambda, then the adjoint has eigenvalue lambda bar. This is something we actually proved in class. It was a little bit sneaky. We mentioned that they didn't have to have the same eigenvector necessarily. It was like an argument by rank nullity and dimension. And this was a kind of subtle. One of the more subtle things I proved in the uh, the adjoint material. Um, I'm really much more a fan of the thing we had earlier about linear independence and orthogonality. But anyway, oh look here we've got one x cubed, and I wanted to orthonormalize that basis with respect to the zero one integral inner product. You know, so here's another one. There's usually some of that. I think as a general pattern that it's not unusual. And I, I think the same is true for Dr. Sprano. I mean, because um, you, I think, yeah, you guys taking abstract yeah. algebra, right? Yeah. I don't so, I'm your L ed, uh huh. <laughs> I hear you. Where are, I wanted test three solution. Come on. Whoa. What has happened here? <laughs> Your kids did something. <laughs> oh, maybe that one. Uh, there, that looks better. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, oh man, it's not actually quite, it's not quite the same test, is it? My original one had, um, had matrices here, right? And I decided to, to get rid of the matrices because my thought process was students would 
would waste 10 minutes doing arithmetic here that was irrelevant. So I decided to strip away the numbers to just test the concept as, as like bare bones as I could, and that's what this looks like. Um, right, so I just said, this is essentially your homework problem, right? I've given you two vectors. One is i times the other, you know, or one is two, one plus i times the other. And then, you know, calculate the real versus the complex angle. So the complex angle is got a cosine which is equal to 1 when you work it out, which means that the complex angle is 0. But on the other hand, the real part of this is, is, is 0 because, yeah. So that means that the real angle is pi over 2 in this particular case. But I don't know. Maybe I believe in your ability to do arithmetic for the quiz. Maybe I'll go back to like actual numerical examples to calculate complex versus real angle for. I don't know. <clears throat> oh, you want to make sure Nathaniel has plenty of time? Oh, that is very, very considerate of you. Um. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, if A is invertible, why is 0 not an eigenvalue of A? All right. Well, remember, A inverse exists if and only if the only solution to the homogeneous problem is 0, right? That is just saying that 0 is not an eigenvector, right? Because the only way you can get out back out 0 times vector is if that vector is the 0 vector. I mean, there is no, this literally means there is no eigenvector with eigenvalue 0. So there you go. That's why A is invertible if and only if lambda equals 0 is not an eigenvalue. Um, here's another way. The determinant's the product of the eigenvalues, right? So if A inverse exists, that means the determinant's non-zero, which means that none of these can be zero. There's another way you could argue. I mean, there's like a dozen different ways to argue the first sentence, okay? Um, the only one that, the only argument I will not accept in this is, you, you know, you're like, why is zero not an eigenvalue of A? Is, it would be something like saying, well, um, it's because you said that if A is invertible, zero is not an eigenvalue. Like, that's not a proof. You're just restating the question again. So do you to give me a statement of something, you know. There's always a subset of students who just restate the, set, restate the problem again, and it makes me go. I think they do that because they don't know what they're doing. Like is it? That's the only reason why. Just because they don't know what they're doing? Yeah. I think they might get some points if they at least write something down. That's true. I probably will give them something. You got a point. Yeah. That's true, it's true. And that's what, I, that's what I assume when they're writing it. I mean, I, I don't think they're that crazy. I don't, like, I mean, well, it depends, it depends. It's hard to, you know, I, I don't, I don't, in, I really don't invest too much time trying to figure out why people are wrong. Some professors invest a lot of time trying to, like, dig into the psychosis of certain wrong answers. Like, why did they write this? Where did this six come from, you know? Like, like, it's like, there doesn't have to be a reason. They just don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing, and they're just writing down. It's like, you know, it's like at the end of a game of telephone trying to figure out why they said bumpkin. Yeah. You know? It just means it was a pumpkin sometime earlier. You don't know. I mean, but it. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I don't know. And, um,. People are, I think people are generally intelligent, but that doesn't mean what they write on a test is intelligent, you know? Um, that's fine. X not equal to zero. Oh, so this argument I just saw somewhere else today. I mean, it was in the process. We were looking at the, the solution to uh, 142 or 143. This same calculation was in there. Um, oh, the one I had before was that if, 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 um, so this problem, for some reason, I traded this problem for the one I showed you a second ago, which was what? I said if a v is equal to 3v, multiply both sides by a. a, a, v, a times 3v. So a squared v is 3 times a v, which is, what, what have I done?
Oh no, but I'm. Oh, 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 oh no, that's not, that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> that's not what I'm doing. That's not it. That's not it at all. <laughs> this is three times three v. So what I'm showing is that a squared v is nine v. So if v is an eigenvector with eigenvalue three for a, it's also an eigenvector with eigenvalue nine for a squared. All right. This says that an eigenvector for, I, for a is also an eigenvector for a inverse with reciprocal eigenvalue. But this is part of a larger family of like theorems about relatedness, like matrices which are related and how their eigenvectors um, can be shared. That's actually a much more interesting topic than you might realize. Given two matrices, right, a and b, when can they have a common eigenvector? When can V be both an eigenvector for A and for B at the same time? Or a more grown-up version of this question, when can you take two matrices A and B, both of which are diagonalizable, right? And when can you diagonalize them with respect to the same similarity transformation? This is called the simultaneous diagonalization problem. It is not covered in my notes. Now, there are things in my notes which are as hard as the simultaneous diagonalization problem. But, I mean, it's, that's a non-trivial problem. It's also very important for physics because if we can simultaneously diagonalize two things, that means that we can, uh, we can measure them both at the same time because eigenvectors are observables in quantum mechanics. So, like, if you can simultaneously diagonalize an operator and the energy operator, that means that you can measure energy and the eigenvalues of that operator at the same time. Quintessential non-example of this would be like energy and momentum can't be simultaneously diagonalized. Um, no, wait, position and momentum can't be simultaneously diagonalized, which means that, that leads to the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle that you can't know both position and momentum with ultimate precision. If you measure one precisely, you don't have a precise understand precise value for the other, and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> turns out the commutator of the two operators has to be zero in order to simultaneously diagonalize them. But none of this is on your quiz, I'm sorry. I, mean, I didn't even put it in your homework because I used to, but I decided that it's just too much static. So, I mean, I probably should get rid of this stuff and put that back in its place, but I think after I talk about this for a while, it's not so scary, right? It starts to just be a kind of system of formulas and almost like a board game to play. I don't, I don't know who's the, who's the villain in the game, I'm not sure. Is it Jordan? I don't know. See, like, you're, you're the villain. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> you're like, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You said that. I didn't say that. Um, no, I'm, I try not to take an adversarial stance towards students. Um, I try not, try not to. Um, okay, so this one, oh, I changed it up, right? I decided that my question was more interesting if I didn't have a real Jordan piece. Notice I changed the data from the problem we were looking at before. <laughs> it's not oh, the no. no, it's not the same because this is the same. That is not. I had v, ah, I had v1 here before. Yeah. Now v2 is also an eigenvector with eigenvalue 3, which means that this is the real Jordan form. And it's not real diagonalizable. Right, because this means complex eigenvalue. If there's even one complex eigenvalue, it's not real diagonalizable. But it is complex diagonalizable because, well, there you go. Um, so, yeah. I've grown fond of this question, real diagonalizable versus complex diagonalizable, because it's a very concrete question, which pretty much, if you understand how to answer that question, you've understood a lot about this whole story arc of the course. It's not as overarching as that homework problem that you asked a question about Carson and then left. Like that's the, that's, that's the, uh, yeah, that problem. That problem, man, that, that's a problem. Uh, I think I changed this problem also. Man, these tests are nothing alike. What happened this time? I don't know. Um, sorry. Uh, let's see here, this and this. Oh, I even told you the inner product. I mean, I, I do try to say that. But. 
But you guys know that already. If I haven't, if I haven't written this here, you guys know that. Um, w is span, find orthonormal basis, and uh, break down this matrix into its, its w and w perp piece. Find the matrix closest to that. It's A. All right. So, yep. Why did you give us the, the integral formula of the inner product one time it's negative one to one and one time it's zero to one? Oh, it depends on the context. Sometimes negative one to one is the more interesting so thing. Why, is it, why did it change? You can make it whatever you want. You can make it seven to eight, but there are applied problems where you're looking at what are called orthogonal polynomials, and if the, the context is zero to one, then the zero one normalized ones are kind of natural. But if the context is minus one to one, then those ones are more natural. So it depends on the problem in differential equations where you're applying them, really. Um, why I have both in my notes is a question of where I got problems and what I was looking at before I wrote the notes, and that is that is lost to history. No one's interested in. How so. How long did it take me to write the notes? Um, I don't know. I've been, this is my 11th year here, so. So have you been just building on them? Yeah, I think it's more or less a focused effort over about two years. Yeah, but in terms of actual hours, when I'm actually just focused writing notes, I can generate about, I don't know, 10, maybe 10 pages a day, something like that. If it's stuff I already know, if it's something I'm learning, it can go much slower. But I haven't written enough lately. I need to write more. Um, I mean, like, I haven't finished Calc 2, for example. There's like a gap in my Calc 2 notes that I haven't quite finished. It's, it's annoying to me. Um, but anyway, the, the university says stuff like, we want you to do research. So I'm like, okay, fine, I'll do research, you know. And so I do. <laughs> Because they don't, they don't care about the notes. Like I could write notes until the, you know, I'd say cows come home. But does that really have meaning to you guys anymore? I don't know. It doesn't save money for them. It also saves money for us. Ah, uh, you like That's the. Why. I and I, I think you know I have run this course different ways. Like I used to run this course with my notes supplemented with a book, and then the students would complain, "We have two books to read," you know. And um. I think it's helpful, right? Yeah. And. But because I got tired of reading that course evaluation, I said, fine, we'll just use my notes. And then, yeah, well, people, people by and large don't complain about my notes. I mean, they're, they're still flaws and so forth, and they need more things here and there. But um, the nice thing is my notes, in some sense, are always a preparation for my tests, you know, because they, they show you how I'm thinking and what I know. and. I can't put things on tests that I don't know, right? So if you know what I know, then it's easy enough to guess where I'm going to go. Um, if, I give you a test, if I give you a text written by somebody else and you study it, then well, if they were writing your test, that would be helpful, perhaps. I mean, but I don't know. It's linear algebra anyway, so it's somewhat. There is, there is an outlier to this, which is I am now next to Dr. Smith, and he has some very interesting linear algebra ideas. So. Like, he was showing me a 221 problem he had. It was really quite delightful. I might give that to you guys. I don't know. Right. I, not on the quiz. We'll see it for the test. But I'm just I'm, I'm kidding. Um, actually, usually the problem, the, the problem he gave me, actually, it was too, it was too hard for you guys. Like, the Isn't problem. 221 lower than this question? Well, this was not a 221 question. This is a question that occurred to him. It was kind of cute. Oh. And um, <laughs> I looked at it, and I thought, that is a really nice subspace question, but if I give it to 321, it's just going to go badly. Because it's not really a linear algebra question, it's an algebra question. And then it dawned on me, I'm teaching abstract algebra too. So out of the, out of the thin blue sky, they had a, is this a subspace question at the start of their test two, and, or test one, I can't remember, in abstract algebra. And they're like, what? Where did that come from? You know, because we were not, it's not a we're not in vector spaces or anything. I mean, well, everything we're doing is vector spaces, but in my defense, though, the, the solution to the problem was actually all about the algebra we were doing in abstract algebra, too, more so. Basically, it's a picky factoring question, but anyway. Should I put that problem on your final? No? It might be fun. I mean, if you don't grade it. 
bonus. It'll be bonus. I, I will put that problem as, as a, it'll be bonus. Yeah, maybe bonus. OK. Um, OK, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm digressing. So we normalize that one, apparently, by dividing by root 13. You take u2, you subtract the piece of it, which is in the u1 direction. Right? This is just Gram Schmidt, and it, and it gives you, oh, horrible. Obviously, I ran out of time to make this problem pretty before I gave it on the test. Bad, bad, bad. This is no good. I, 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 bet, I bet this problem is like a twist of something I meant to do. I, do I never want things like that to happen on my test. This is, I was gritting my teeth when I wrote this, I guarantee you. Right. I mean, if it's like 8, 6, 7, 5, 3, or 9, you're like, OK, well, this, this seems right. It's like 1, 2, 3, 4. Or, you know, if there's, there's, if there's an abundance of integers in the answer, you probably know, like, yeah, this still seems, 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 seems oh, like. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is just, just, just horrible. Just, yeah, this is, I mean, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. And then, oh, and then, I was worrisome, not 100% sure about my arithmetic here. Yeah, you don't say. All right. <clears throat> See test three solution. I thought we were looking at test three solution. Maybe the other one that has right, right enough. Yeah, that's <laughs> This is a nice little problem. <coughs> this one I got? You got this one already? It was just very similar, but it just was a little different. I think. Isn't this neat? This is the, this is, what this is saying is that if you have an orthogonal set, then it satisfies the Pythagorean identity. So that's really, it's really pretty. Find a non-diagonal symmetric matrix with eigenvalues 6 and 10. All right. Now, so this problem, I showed you guys this in class like how to, how to build a matrix using eigenvalues. So this is just that problem. So if we do u1, u1 transpose, u2, u2 transpose, then these are those orthogonal projectors. It orthogonally projects onto the 6 eigenspace or to the 10 eigenspace for this other one. And so that will be a matrix that has eigenvalue 6 and 10. It's symmetric. And it takes u1 and u2 as its orthonormal eigenbasis. So it's just like. The real spectral theorem in reverse, essentially, this is the idea of this problem. But, hmm. Thank you. Is it is it possible for a four by four matrix to have no real eigenvectors? Yes, it'd be true. Question: Is it possible for a three by three? real matrix to have no real eigenvectors. <clears throat> three by three matrix, what do you think? True or false? No real eigenvectors. Is it possible? False. False. There has to be at least one real eigenvector. Why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying if we look at the characteristic equation, it's cubic. And a cubic equation can have at most one conjugate complex pair. There always has to be at least one real, at least one real um, solution to the characteristic equation, which means there's at least one real eigenvector. So yes, this would have turned out differently if it was 3 by 3, or really anything odd. But for even, you can, you can make blocks of rotations. They never fix anything. They're always rotating in a bunch of planes. They don't have to have eigenvectors. It already happens in dimension 2. It happens in dimension 4, 6, 8, whatever. If Langle Wrangle denotes an inner product on V, then for any choice of positive constant H, H Langle x comma y wrangle defines an inner product on v. The answer is indeedly doodly. That is true. You can always take an inner product and rescale it to give you another new new inner product. Um, I mean, here's the proof. I mean, 
well, it's symmetric, and here's that it's zero only if that's, you know, zero. And you can prove linearity of the entries just the same. Now, whenever you read true-false questions like this, they might seem like they're completely out of left field this semester, if not for this conversation. I mean, at this point, since we've had this conversation, all of a sudden they became infinitely more likely for the test. Before we had this conversation, some of these were very unlikely because it's just not a place that our conversations have gone this semester, right? So, so um, that's the danger of asking for, <laughs> the danger of asking me questions about a test, I suppose. Here's that proof. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> Giving me ideas for what I should put on your quiz. That's helpful. Um, but I'm going to. If it's these exact problems. <laughs> um, so I will, I mean, I will try to ask things on the quiz which tell me, have you understood what an eigenvector is? Do you know, how to, you know can you, you know, can you work with data of eigenvectors if you're given it? Do things that we've done with eigenvectors is one sort of bag of questions. The other is like, do you understand what is orthogonal, how we make projections? You know, do you know, is a basis orthonormal? If it's not orthonormal, can you make it orthonormal, you know? So that, that's usually where I start. And then, I mean, there's always something more around the edges. But here, this question asks to prove that the column vectors that the columns in a O2 matrix are orthonormal. I proved this in general for you guys for like an ON matrix that the columns of an orthogonal matrix are orthonormal. As if they give you an orthonormal basis for RN and um, this is just the two-dimensional. And it's actually pretty easy just like straight calculate it. This dot that, that dot that, that dot that. You can work it out. It's one, one, zero. Yeah. Now you guys have got me wondering, if we get past that bad algebra sheet on that other one, did it have solutions to the other problems? <clears throat> Ooh, I like this question. Oh, I thought I just discovered that. Huh. Is that right? Huh. Okay. Yeah, let me go back to that bad algebra one. I'm curious. <laughs> hey, that's got the A squared one, doesn't it? Well, this is, this is most unfortunate. I think I understand what happened here. Um, I have a pen that I used to like grade the online tests, and I must have somehow used this PDF to test it without realizing that, you know, oh well. So this, this, yeah, this, this, um, this I did in class, right? To prove linear, prove orthogonal, non-zero implies linear independent. Take a linear combination, you take the inner product with respect to Vj, use the property of the inner product, blah, 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 blah. All the things are zero except for one. It gives you Cj times the, the inner product of Vj with Vj is zero, but that's the inner product of Vj, that's the norm of Vj squared which is non-zero by assumption, which means that Cj has to be zero. Cj being arbitrary, we've proved that C1 equals C2 equals C3, da 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 equals Cn is zero. So like this, this argument we did, we did in class is true. And uh, not diagonalizable, yeah, over R or C. Yeah, I didn't like this question. I think I swapped it out on the actual, I don't know, see I know, now I'm curious what happened here. I wonder if I made a, did I make a test three after test three to like show what I wanted to do? Like, I don't understand what happened. Not sure what happened. Here, let me go back to that for just a second more. All right, I'll make it bigger, just in case people want answers. You know what I'll do? I will post these PDFs and course content to be civilized. Yeah, because otherwise it's kind of obnoxious. People have to copy stuff off a of video. It's kind of horrible. Yeah. I'll, I'll post these in course content. <laughs>